Kuon was first released in Japan on April 1st, 2004. It was followed by releases in Northern America on December 7 that same year, and then in Europe two years later on April 28th, 2006. A survival horror game by From Software, Kuon was set in a mansion in Kyoto during the Heian period, generally considered to be the final part of classical Japanese history. The story sees several characters, all women, exploring an old mansion and surrounding areas to figure out what's going on and why it has seemingly been taken over by monsters and the undead. The game received somewhat middling reviews and low sales at time of release, however, meaning it only had a limited print run before From Software moved on to other games. Yet despite its lack of success upon release, Kuon has gained somewhat of a cult status in modern times, for good reason, and its small print run means that the game often sells for hundreds of dollars second hand now. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. No, we're here to talk about the wonder that is Kuon's deep, layered story. This is Kuon Explained. Kuon is split into three phases. You begin with either Yin or Yang. It doesn't matter which, as these stories take place concurrently. Yin sees you play as Utsuki, a shrine maiden and the daughter of the exorcist Dōman. Yang sees you play as Sakuya, a disciple of Dōman. Sakuya's phase begins slightly before Utsuki's in terms of the timeline, but they both end at the exact same point. Once you've finished both Yin and Yang, the Kuon phase opens up, which allows you to play through the game's ending with an entirely different character. As such, in a very From Software way, the game's story is often left for you to try and piece together from the crumbs they scatter throughout the three phases, and it can be a little confusing to follow. So let's take a look. The story begins with Sakuya and the other exorcists in training, who work for Utsuki's father, Doman. Doman was once a great exorcist, but at some stage he was banished from the Emperor's court, and now he works as a civilian. Sakuya is his only female disciple, and she started working with him because he was the only exorcist she could find who didn't look down on her for being a woman. This is somewhat funny, considering the game's final character. These exorcists are summoned to Lord Fujiwara's mansion. He claims that demons have infested the estate, and he wishes for Dolman to get rid of them. Yet, by the time they arrive, the Lord has disappeared. This is where the game begins, although it's not where the story begins. We'll get to that later, but first, a quick recap of the game. Both Utsuki and Sakuya explore the mansion grounds at the same time, even running into each other on several occasions. The first part of both scenarios plays out almost exactly the same, with both women needing to find a way into the locked temple, and both needing to coax Ayako, the Lord's daughter, out of her room. Both even have the same boss battle with Lord Fujiwara, who, it seems, has been turned into a grotesque monster. Both gain access to a tunnel beneath the temple, leading them in through a secret entrance, and it's around this point that the stories diverge. Utsuki discovers her sister, who she's seen numerous times around the mansion acting strange, is… shock horror… actually dead. Not only is she dead, but she wants to become one with Utsuki in a strange ritual that will allow her to be reborn once more. It's this ritual that lies at the heart of the game. Utsuki eventually agrees to get into a wicker chest with her sister, and when she wakes up and starts exploring once again, memories start flooding back. It turns out that, shock horror, Utsuki was somewhat responsible for her sister's death. But that's not all. Utsuki herself is also dead, killed by her sister so their bodies could merge in the wicker chest and she could be reborn. Whoops. Sakuya, meanwhile, after making her way into the temple, is forced to fight the horrendously terrifying Lady Fujiwara, finishing off both of Ayako's parents. 
She then joins Utsuki and her sister outside, and agrees to accompany them out of the shrine grounds. Apparently, a first for both sisters. Sakuya is soon attacked by Kureha, Utsuki's sister, as well as various other monsters outside the mansion grounds. After much running around, Sakuya eventually sees Kureha throw Utsuki off a cliff, and Doryo, another disciple that Sakuya calls her older brother, appears to be dead as well. Kureha merges with Doryo and takes off, stalking Sakuya throughout the grounds. Sakuya eventually makes her way back underground where she runs into an undead Utsuki. Now aware of everything that's happened and who now wants to merge with her. The final chapter sees you play as Abe no Seime, a character only hinted at in the opening chapters. Abe no Seime, who Doman considers to be his greatest rival, has caught wind of strange things afoot at the mansion and has arrived to clean up the mess. After a quick run around the estate, she also ends up underground, finding the undead Utsuki with an unyielding desire to eat human flesh, although some of her human morals still remain. And finally, her father himself, Dolman, who plans to kill Abe no Seime and make her his undead puppet. Abe no Seime, who plays basically as god mode, destroys Dolman and saves the day. She attempts to destroy the mulberry tree that's behind everything, but she's stopped by Sakuya, who wants to allow Utsuki to finish the ritual. Utsuki takes her father's body into the wicker chest and the game ends with her reborn as an innocent child in Sakuya's care, the only two people to survive the horrific night at the mansion. It's this ritual with the wicker chests and the sacred mulberry trees that are at the heart of Kuon's story. But much of this story is hidden throughout notes and item descriptions, so let's take a deeper look at what it all means. Inside the mansion grounds stand two large, very old mulberry trees. These trees have existed since ancient times and the nearby shrine was built especially for them. Trees have long been worshipped in Japan as sacred, living objects, so this itself isn't very strange. In one note, Kureha mentions that the twins you see running around throughout the game, the evil children who seem to be behind everything, egging everyone on, appear to be manifestations of the Mulberry God. They are, in essence, part of the trees, taking on human form. In one of his books, Dolman notes that the mulberry trees harbour a powerful spell. They are living creatures with wills of their own. They live far longer than humans and are much more intelligent. He's not sure where exactly these trees came from, but rumour has it that the ancestors of the Hata clan found them and brought them to the mansion long ago. It's also possible that their seeds floated over to Japan from China, Korea or some other foreign land. Either way, they've been there a long, long time. The mulberry trees aren't the only things worshipped at the shrine, however. The shrine also worships the silkworms that come from the trees. These are no ordinary silkworms, however. The parents of the silkworms are also said to be incarnations of the two mulberry trees, and the mulberries themselves are the tree's eggs. Silkworms born from these eggs are said to have magical powers, powers that can bring back the dead. The silkworm journal you find in-game details raising them. The eggs take roughly two weeks to hatch and must be kept in a warm place. First, they turn grey, and then once they hatch, they are small and furry. They eat mulberry leaves, and within a few days, lose all their fur, becoming shiny and translucent. They spend the next week doing little other than sleeping and growing, shedding over and over as they get bigger and bigger. Not all survive this process, but still, they keep eating more and more mulberry leaves, they then start spinning beautiful silver cocoons 
about a month after hatching, and a few days later, emerge as moths. Yet these moths only survive for a few days, first laying more eggs, and then dying soon thereafter. As the Silkworm Journal laments, what is the purpose of these silkworms if all they do is grow, give birth to more eggs, and then die? Well, these silkworms are used in the secret ritual to revive the dead. That is their true purpose. In her diary, Kudeha mentions that she met the twins on the shrine grounds and they told her to sleep with some silkworms in a wicker chest for the night. She did as they said and woke up feeling normal, a feeling she hadn't had for a long time. At this point, Kudeha was undead, so it makes sense that she wouldn't be feeling too hot. The silkworms are endowed with the magical powers of the mulberry tree, being its seeds, essentially. They're not just vital for the ritual, they are the ritual. These silkworms can bring back the dead. But in order to do so, they must feed, and they consume that which is inside the wicker chest with them. Humans. After Kudeha dies, her father Dolman places her inside a wicker chest with these silkworms. His research and experiments have led him to conclude that once this fusion has been completed nine times, the spell will be perfected. Kudeha will finally be reborn again. It can't just be done once or twice. This results in an imperfect creation, as seen by Kudeha's physical weakness and, eventually, rotting skin. The silkworms consume the human inside the wicker chest, eventually spinning a cocoon from which a new human emerges, supposedly getting closer and closer to perfection each time, with the ninth time completing the ritual for good. This is why you can find cocoons all throughout the game, particularly in the temple and underground areas. They are the products of the ritual, an attempt to fuse the silkworms of the sacred mulberry trees with sick or dying humans. Yet, as Dolman discovers, this ritual was never intended to revive the dead. Everyone had it wrong, even him. The ritual was always intended for the silkworms, not the humans. In the priest's journal you can find in-game, he reveals that for several days now, strange sounds have been emanating from the ground under my feet. They say a creature emerged from the bowels of the earth, and that this temple was built to prevent it from proceeding any further. Perhaps this creature has awakened underneath this temple, and is howling. A short while after this, people around the mansion started falling ill. Lady Fujiwara insisted that the sick be confined to the temple to halt the spread of this mystery disease, but she ended up falling ill as well, joining them inside the locked temple. This is why the temple is locked at the beginning of the game, and why you can hear all sorts of monstrous noises inside. But where did this mystery illness come from? What did the priest hear? that sounded like a creature howling in the bowels beneath the temple. This was undoubtedly Dolman carrying out his silkworm experiments. Kudeha is not the first person he attempted the ritual with, although she was undoubtedly the most important to him. He had long been carrying out experiments, hoping to better understand the power of the silkworms and the mulberry trees so he could use them for his own nefarious purposes. He mostly conducted these experiments in the tunnels beneath the temple, the same route that Sakuya and Utsuki take to get in. As an unfortunate side effect, the people living in the manor above suddenly found themselves beset by a mysterious disease, all because Dolman wanted to revive his daughter and take revenge on his rival, Abenoseme. The man Lord Fujiwara asked to help was the very same man who caused the problem in the first place. The creatures you can find around the manor, the Gaki, the Yamabito, the Mizuhiki, 
and the Enyo are all creatures created by Dorman's failures. It's believed the Yamabito, the enemies closest resembling humans, are the result of having gone through the cocoon process only once. Those who have gone through it another time then become gucky, and even more times then lead to the other monstrosities. Lord and Lady Hujiwara are also products of failed rituals. In Lady Hujiwara's case, she was placed in a wicker chest, not with silkworms, but first a cat, and later with a centipede. This resulted in the monstrous creature she became, a creature that then ate her own son. But what about the twins, the mulberry trees? Why does the ritual exist in the first place if not to revive humans? What is it that they really want? The true purpose of the silkworm ritual, the goal of performing the process nine times, isn't to perfectly revive a human being. No, the goal of the ritual is actually to create another mulberry tree. On the ninth successful time, the creature that emerges will be a physical embodiment of the tree, much like the twins were. The twins, however, were tied directly to the trees. They were a part of them, representations, if you will. This ritual, however, will allow for the tree to be reborn fully as a whole new being, no longer tied to the existing trees as they are now. During the game, Sakuya burns down one of the trees, and this then kills one of the twins, greatly angering the other. When she arrives, Abe no Seime then gathers the power-restricting spikes necessary to restrain the powers of the remaining tree, but she's stopped by Sakuya at the last minute before she can go through with it. Sakuya already killed one tree. The one remaining is the only mulberry left, and the ritual with Dorman's daughters has now been carried out eight times, meaning Utsuki only needs to step into the wicker chest one more time for the ritual to be complete. Abe no Seime even reminds Sakuya, we simply have no idea what will be born from the chest. Yet Sakuya insists, after all the betrayals she's been through, the monsters she's seen, perhaps in that moment she believes that whatever comes out of that chest won't be evil. And ultimately, she believes that Utsuki deserves another chance. She can't bear to see her die as well, not after everything else that's happened. The tree is a god, after all, and Utsuki was innocent in everything that happened. Perhaps it's a brand new start for both, a chance at a brand new life for both. It's the moment that all parties in the game, both good and evil, have been working towards for their own varying reasons. Abe no Seime gives in and hands Sakuya the power repressing spikes, just in case. Whatever comes out of that wicker chest, it'll be up to her to deal with it. Utsuki drags her father into the chest as punishment for all the crimes he committed, and Abe no Seime walks away. Unsure herself of what will emerge from that chest the next morning, but trusting Sakuya's judgement. The next morning, Sakuya leaves with a child, who looks just like a young Utsuki. The ritual worked. The mulberry tree was reborn. Utsuki was reborn. Kureha was reborn. Even Dolman was reborn. A new life was created. A mix of everyone who had merged within the chest. A new, innocent life with a chance for a fresh start. And in her hands, she holds a branch of mulberries, the seeds of the tree, presumably to carry on its legacy and plant elsewhere. The mansion and all the people in it are gone, but the mulberry tree will live on, just as it was hoping for all along. And that's it. The heart of the game is about the spirit of a mulberry tree trying to be reborn, and the foolish actions of one human with too much power clouding his judgement, bringing about the destruction of not only his own family, 
but that of the lords he worked for as well. Depending on your point of view, it's somewhat a happy ending, but it also hints very subtly with the mulberry branch in young Utsuki's hand that it's not all over yet either. The mulberry tree will live on, both within young Utsuki's reborn body and with the seeds she holds in her hand. While it's perhaps a little more straightforward than some of From Software's later games, there's definitely still a deep, rich story hidden behind the horrifying gameplay, and you can even see aspects that were taken from this game and used later in Sekiro, such as the horrifying centipedes and the giant ape bosses, to name a few. But that's all for this video. If there's anything else you'd like me to take a look at from the game, or any other questions you might have, please feel free to leave a comment below and let me know what you think. And I'll see you again next time.